person for the next session. Sir is a senior consultant diabetologist and physician based at Golpur Shantiniketan. So uh, over to you, Dr. Ganguly, sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the next uh, topic of this session is uh, uh, NFLD tackling the upcoming pandemic. Uh, the speaker of the topic today is uh, Dr. Rajiv Chawla. So, a uh, short introduction of Dr. Chawla. Uh, he's a DNB teacher and guide for last 20 years, more than 80 papers on uh, micro and macrovascular complication, awarded AACC uh, travel agent twice for the masterclass paper, authorized of 10 books on diabetes and 10 orations awarded, uh, past chairman of RSSDI, Delhi chapter, and past secretary, RSSDI uh, national body, Organizing Secretary, Annual Conference, RSSDI, 2013. Good enough, good enough, good enough I think. Thank you. Um, <laughs> scientific Chairman of RSSDI and many others. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Chawla, uh, we are waiting for your uh, kind delivery on this topic. Over to you, Dr. Yeah. Let me share my slides. Can you see my slides, Dr. Gangli? Yes, sir, visible. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Gangli, for all those kind words. At the outset, I'm thankful to BDCon organizing committee, in particular to Dr. Amita Vishwas, a very old, close friend. Uh, early days, 20 years ago, he was working in Delhi and we shared many times the dais. So thanks for remembering me. And uh, you'll appreciate that my task has been done uh, more difficult by a wonderful oration by Dr. J.J. Mukherjee. And towards the end of the day, uh, I'll still try to do some justice to the topic, what has been assigned to me, what is metabolically associated fatty liver disease or MEFLD and how to check this growing pandemic. Objective of my session will be to discuss the relationship of MEFLD with metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes and underlying pathophysiological mechanisms. We know metabolically associated fatty liver disease or what popularly has been known as NEFLD. It is one of the commonest chronic liver impairment in absence of significant alcohol intake or secondary causes. That means you practically rule out alcohol as a cause of MEFLD or NEFLD. Obesity and insulin resistance primarily predispose this condition. It is closely associated with metabolic syndrome and other abnormalities. It is progressive, has potential cause end stage liver disease and could lead on to hepatocarcinogenesis. And cardiometabolic diseases may also dictate the outcome. So let's see what is nephron. It's a chronic liver condition which is characterized by hepatic fat accumulation in the absence of ethanol abuse, I told you usually associated with insulin resistance, hyperglycemia, and CBD. NFL is when you have presence of fatty liver without hepatocellular injury, that means without ballooning. NASH is when you talk about presence of hepatic steatosis and inflammation with hepatocellular injury, which could be still with or without fibrosis. And then you have toward the end fibrosis as a result of NASH leading on to cirrhosis and maybe terminating into liver cancer also. The various risk factors for hepatic steatosis are it is excess of body fat, whether it is generalized adiposity, subcutaneous or intra-abdominal adiposity, leading on to increased insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Again, age and gender, it usually tends to happen early in men by almost 50 years, in women by almost 60 years. When we talk about in terms of ethnicity, Asian Indians are at a greater risk as compared to uh, Blacks and Hispanics. And when we talk about diet and vitamins use, fructose, high carbohydrate intake, especially increased intake of saturated fats and trans fatty acid leads on to higher insulin resistance and hepatic steatosis. Physical inactivity classically predisposes to hepatic steatosis. And then there is unfortunately clustering, which has been seen 
in uh, Asian patients, so there could be a genetic predisposition by virtue of PN, PLA3, or maybe PPAR, RG, or SREBC, which could predispose to higher prevalence of maybe cirrhosis, NASH, or Neffeld, or hepatic stasis. As I said, Asian Indians are at a greater risk. So Asian Indians with Neffeld, they have a high truncal subcutaneous fat as compared to any other race. If you see, and even non-obese, this is a uh, uh, paper from Dr. Anup Mishra, non-obese BM, with BMI less than 25, those who are diabetic, they are also even at a greater risk for not only higher abdominal, but liver fat. So you see, those patients who are diabetic, even if their BMI is less than 25 as compared to non-diabetic controls, not only they have higher total abdominal fat, they have higher intra-abdominal fat, maybe for same BMI, and their liver span is larger as compared to non-diabetic controls. So if I say that nearly 50% of non-obese patients with type 2 diabetes, they have nephil, and this is what we also proved in our paper, which we presented at ACE, 2019, where we said that even lean thin diabetics, they are at a greater risk of developing nephil. It was almost 58%. Those who had BMI less than 25, by virtue of picking them up by R fee, we could pick up nephil much earlier. And we said that novel metabolic score based on pentad of clinical, biochemical, and radiological profile of non obese type 2 diabetes with nephil. And it was seen in almost 58% contributing towards nephil. So if you talk about overall prevalence data from India, I'll not go into the details of all studies as early as 2000 to 2007 and 9, almost 30 to 35% of patients, whether they are diabetic or obese, if you do an ultrasound, they will have an, an evidence of nephil by one or the other criteria. So let's see what is the relationship of nephil with diabetes and hepatic stenosis and what are the contributing mechanism. When you talk about metabolism of triglyceride in liver, there are three major sources. One is diet, which almost contributes to almost 15% of overall fat into the liver. When you talk of an endogenous synthesis, unfortunately it accounts for almost 25 to 15, 25 to 26% contributing towards steatohepatitis, and adipose tissue, again, contributing almost 60% because of insulin resistance into the adipose tissue and muscle. So you have increased production of free fatty acid, contributing towards increased free fatty acids into the liver. Triglyceride production is on the higher side, and then it leads on to steatohepatitis. So it is not only the diet, but the heredity, predisposition, but also subcutaneous and uh, visceral fat because of insulin resistance which contributes towards pathogenesis of hepatitis. This is how the cycle goes on. The moment there is an increased insulin resistance into adipose tissue, I told you, there is going to be an increase. Lipolysis, increased free fatty acid production, adipokines, cytokines are on the higher side. Unfortunately, adiponectin goes on the lower side, and that leads to development of steatosis by getting increased triglyceride senses into the liver, which is not only lipotoxic, then these triglyceride derived metabolites, they lead on to mitochondrial dysfunction, ER stress, and then leads on to activation of inflammatory pathways or kufr cells, hyperplasia, which then leads on to active steatohepatitis, and towards the end, then leads on to steatohepatitis with fibrosis, finally leading on to cirrhosis and a greater risk of developing uh, HCC or other sorts of liver cancer. So starting from steatosis, if you look on the spectrum of Neffeld, there is going to be a NASH and subsequently a fibrosis, which then terminates into cirrhosis and higher risk of developing HCC. Neffeld and insulin resistance are more severe, as I said, in South Asian patients than other races. And again, this is a wonderful publication in 2006, JCI, which talked about liver triglyceride and insulin resistance in Asian versus white Caucasian in USA. Not only we tend to have much higher liver fat, our adiponectin levels are much lower, maybe even at a same amount of BMI as compared to Caucasian. So we tend to have much higher visceral fat contributing towards insulin resistance and contributing towards adiponectin reduction, which predisposes not only to nephrid, but stage liver disease also. So nephrid could be associated with dyslipidemia, subclinical inflammation as well as CAD. So if you have look on the overall causative 
factors toward Nefert and Nash with increased free fatty acids and cytokines because of dysfunctional adipose tissue, because of resistance into the adipose tissue, which will then lead on to dyslipidemia, which is classically seen in setting of type 2 diabetes with high triglyceride production, reduced HDL, and increase in ApoB and small dense LDL cholesterols. Not only that this will induce hyperinsulinemia, but will also lead on to subclinical inflammation, atherosclerosis, and higher cardiovascular risk in these patients. So Nefeld independently actually predicts subclinical atherosclerosis in Asian patients as compared to Caucasian. For any level of presence of Nefeld or NASH, you tend to have much higher atherosclerosis. So may I suggest that there is a common link between Nefeld, metabolic syndrome, and type 2 diabetes, and it could be actually the existence of insulin resistance, not only into adipose tissue, but also into the liver, and that increased abdominal fat, which is primarily visceral fat contributing or worsening insulin resistance. So Nefeld could be a hepatic manifestation of metabolic syndrome, or it could also be a precursor of metabolic syndrome. So it is a dynamic bi-directional relationship between type 2 diabetes and Nefeld. I'll not be going into the details of this algorithm, but suffice to say that moment you have increase in insulin resistance into the adipose tissue, into the visceral fat, into the liver, there is not only going to be an increased lipolysis, increased triglyceride production, which will lead on to characteristic dyslipidemia and predisposes to Nefeld. And the presence of Nefeld with worsening of insulin resistance then leads on to NASH and then leads on to actually further built up in insulin resistance, then worsening hyperglycemia and the setting of type 2 diabetes. So when we talk of diabetes and Nefeld together, we know Nefeld is much more common in type 2 diabetics, almost 50 to 75% diabetics, they have fatty liver by ultrasound. I told you our own study, most of our patients were having BMI less than 25, mean BMI was actually close to 24, and still we had almost 58% patient having established Nefeld when we picked it up by our fee. So the risk of NASH is 2.6 times in presence of hyperglycemia. So there could be elevated enzymes which could predict the future development of diabetes and difficulty in obtaining adequate glycemic control in presence of Nefeld could be because of increased insulin resistance. So Nefeld and risk of type 2 diabetes is a very common link. One Almost 11,000 patients in this Korean study which were evaluated, after five years, their fasting insulin level at baseline and at follow-up, and it was seen those patients who had fatty liver, they were having much higher fasting insulin levels. In other words, they had much higher insulin resistance as compared to the control group. So the risk of developing type 2 diabetes at five-year follow-up with overall incidence almost as high as in those patients who are having fatty liver, which is much higher as compared to someone who does not have a fatty liver at all. So if you study all the uh, groups, one, two, three, and four, irrespective of the education, smoking, exercise, obesity or exercise level, alone liver fat predicted onset of type 2 diabetes in these patients and fatty liver, that is why it is said that predicts future development of type 2 diabetes independent of insulin resistance and a baseline fasting glucose level. So Korean studies talk about, I told you that 107 patients with sustained fatty liver, they were followed for a five-year period and they were at a much greater risk for developing type 2 diabetes as compared to someone who didn't have Nefeld at all. So combined together, Nefeld, insulin resistance and obesity could be a uh, precursor of maybe type 2 diabetes developing almost five years. And this has been again proven in another study by Sung et al. In 2012, almost a follow-up data of 12,000 patients, those who were non-diabetic and they were followed for a five-year duration for incident diabetes. If they had Nefeld, insulin resistance and obesity together, they were at a much greater risk so this could be an independent predictor of onset of type 2 diabetes. Let me suggest you an algorithm for diagnosis of Nefeld NASH in patients with pre-diabetes or diabetes. All those patients who have pre-diabetes or diabetes, if their enzymes are normal, you can just leave them alone and they could be just evaluated periodically like a standard care. Moment you have enzymes on the higher side ELT or maybe an ultrasound which is abnormal, Rule out other causes of liver diseases, especially if you have a long-standing diabetes, more than 10 years, if you have evidence of steatosis, maybe clinically or on ultrasound, if their HbA1c is more than 8.5%, their triglycerides are more than 250 milligram, and they have a genetic predisposition, we must assess these patients either by RP or by 
fibro scan for the presence of fibrosis or maybe an MR elastography to look for presence of fibrosis. If there's a low risk of fibrosis, again, these can be uh, sort of followed up as a standard care. If you have an intermediate risk, ideally they should be uh, undergoing a liver biopsy to prove the diagnosis of NASH if it is there or if it is absent. All those patients who are at a greater risk or very high risk of fibrosis, not only lifestyle modification, they must be subjected to a definite treatment also. So let us see, let's see what is the algorithm for management of these patients, those who have definite NASH once it is diagnosed. So patient with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes with a definite NASH, not only control of other CV risk factors is going to be important, it is glucose control with metformin as a first-line therapy, an ideal blood pressure control with ACE or ARBs as first-line therapy, and lipid lowering, especially with statin as first-line therapy, and you could add fibrates also if their triglyceride levels are very, very high. But if these patients have uh, evidence of NASH, which is proven on RV or maybe MRI elastography or through a fibro scan or maybe uh, through a biopsy, these patients not only should be given a lifestyle intervention, a goal of at least 8 to 10% weight reduction, but they should also be subjected to pharmacological treatment in the form of pyoglutazone as first-line therapy. And second line could be different options. So potential therapeutic approaches to management of nephrod could be with pros and cons. Weight reduction will go a long way, not only in improving all comorbidity, but also has long-term issues are that it may not be sustainable weight reduction. Diet, of course, it will improve all comorbidities. Again, there is a question mark whether it will have a long-term success with most of the patient in terms of diet, exercise, as well as weight reduction. They fail to maintain their uh, levels and targets. Antioxidant like vitamin E, I'll be discussing the trial, improves oxidative stress and inflammation, but long-term results are not there. Sensizers like pyoglitazone improves insulin resistance and blood glucose. Again, there could be some adverse effect because of long-term usage of pyoglitazone, especially with 30 milligram. Statins, well, lipids along with fibrates could be of some use. Of course, under the guidance of physician, yeah, well, UDCA, it may decrease transaminases, but long-term, there is no improvement in histopathology. Drugs like GLP-1 analog and SGLT-2 these days are very promising in terms of reduction of NASH as long as there is no uh, end-stage fibrosis. Well, I, I must discuss here a previous study which compared pyoglitazone vitamin E versus placebo. It was 96 weeks trial where adults with NASH without diabetes, cirrhosis, hepatic uh, heart failure or hepatitis C, those who had limited alcohol intake over last five years, they were enrolled and they were randomized either to pyoglitazone 30 milligram 80 patient, vitamin E 800 milligram 84 patient and placebo arm had 83 patient. And results were that there was a definite improvement in enzymes versus placebo with pyoglitazone as well as with vitamin E. But uh, uh, insulin resistance reduction was primarily seen with pyoglitazone. It was not actually seen with placebo or with vitamin E. But unfortunately, obviously, there was a weight gain because the study was in 30 milligram pyoglitazone. These days, we advocate that we should give only 15 milligram of pyoglitazone, which has all the benefits minus side effects. So weight gain happened in this study with pyoglitazone over 96 weeks, although there was a reduction in insulin resistance and reduction in enzymes. Metformin, well, all 11 RCTs on 671 participants, where 27% patients were diabetic, has failed to show any improvement in terms of liver histopathology, although it improves glycemic control. We know it's a wonderful drug. TZs, of course, the mechanism benefits in nephrod are different. It enhances fatty acid uptake and synthesis in adipose tissue, leads on to adipocyte differentiation, adipocyte uh, sort of evolve and there is a formation of new adipocytes which are much more insulin sensitive as compared to the old stub bond adipocytes. It upregulates production of adiponectin which is very very significant. Reduction in peroxysm proliferated reactivated receptor uh, nuclear expression has been demonstrated with pyoglitazone. Vitamin E Again, it protects against oxidative damage and mitochondrial toxicity. So it could be of benefit in Nephrod, what was seen in previous trial. But histological improvement and resolution of NASH has been seen both with vitamin E as well as pyoglitazone in terms of uh, improvement in Nephrod activity score. Overall, mean change has happened. But if you truly see the fibrosis score does not change much, 
liver enzymes improve overall there could be some improvement in histopathology in terms of reduction in steatohepatitis but fibrosis does not change so long term whether these drugs will reduce the progression towards nash and end stage uh, hepatic failure or cirrhosis is difficult to say because these trials are not very long pivens were only for 96 weeks so to summarize consider screening for type 2 diabetes in every patient and look for other cardiovascular risk factors in these patient do active lifestyle intervention intervention with a target of weight loss almost 10% by exercise and diet and lifestyle modification treatment of dyslipidemia has to be there with statin or maybe with fibrates of course with close monitoring of liver function enzymes treatment of type 2 diabetes we must achieve good glycemic control with metformin consider early use of pegletazone in diabetic patient with nefeld consider glp1 analog or these days uh, sglt2 i am not going into the details of those trials but there are very promising trials with sglt2 inhibitor that there could be a reduction in nefeld score and overall activity and it could actually check the progression towards nash or fibrosis bariatric surgery also had limited success and treatment of non alcoholic steatohepatitis with uh, selective drugs is going to be important so to conclude abdominal obesity and insulin resistance are linked between metabolic syndrome type 2 diabetes and nefeld actually uh, if we say it is a precursor of metabolic syndrome rather than the hepatic manifestation of metabolic syndrome so nefeld should be looked upon as a precursor of not only type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome because nefeld increases the risk of incidence type 2 diabetes i've shown you three four trials nefeld is much more prevalent unfortunately in asian patients it tends to happen at a much lower bmi less than 25 with much higher visceral fat and insulin resistance in these patients contributing toward development of nefeld nefeld is central to development of diabetes lifestyle management including diet and exercise will go a long way and use of drugs like metformin maybe uh, vitamin e high dose is 800 mg because there could be actually an increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke and cv death with vitamin e in the long term so pegletazone may be a better drug after metformin or even maybe in the future once you get an approval of sglt2 inhibitors after metformin in the management of nefeld that could be a wonderful option so we need to judiciously judiciously choose our options in these patient thank you very much for your patience listening i'll stop sharing here and uh, will uh, be keen to have some discussion uh, thank you dr chawla for very lucid and elaborate presentation thank you uh, now it is the uh, time for the question answer session if you if you any question you can ask directly to the presenter or you can uh, write over the chat box yeah uh, thank you sir and i will also ask dr jaji mukherjee sir and dr chawla to uh, you know be there for the question and answer session i have one question so i'll read it out for the uh, for dr jaji mukherjee sir so there is a question that uh, although you have uh, quite elaborately discussed in your slide that there is some lacuna regarding the cvot trials in terms of uh, another uh, sglt2 and uh, gliptin combination that is wilda and remo but particularly in the indian context where do you see this combination faring against this empalina combination answer is very simple if you are wanting to use it for glycemic control you have data with remogliflozin and you have data with wilda gliptin will this transfer exactly like what empa has done with regards to cardiovascular outcome trial or renal benefit you cannot say prior to the what is cd trial you could have got away by saying all this is inverted commas class effect unfortunately you can't get away with that now because ertugliflozin had exactly the same population like empa reg outcome trial just read up all 100% i mean 99.9% had established cardiovascular disease and surprisingly er2 did not give any benefit it was not harmful first of all it was not harmful it was non inferior but it not did not give 3p mes benefit did not give renal benefits did not give cardiovascular death benefits mortality benefits now you would if you say remogliflozin is exactly the same as empagliflozin dapagliflozin answer my friend is no 
Remogliflozin is it a bad molecule? Answer, my friend, is no. It is a good SGLT2 inhibitor. You will get your glycemic benefit with remogliflozin. If you want to extrapolate and say it will do 3P maze benefit, it will reduce hospital heart failure, it will give me renal benefit, you cannot say that to your patient because you don't have the data. Same with Vildagliptin and same for Teriligliptin. Again, I'm not saying don't use them. You're, you're absolutely okay to use. These are drugs which have been there for a long period of time. And they are very good, not very good, at par. There was a question in the previous session as to which DPP4 inhibitor is better. They're all the same, my friend, as far as glycemic control goes. Extra glycemic benefits, we can discuss later. So a Vildagliptin, a Teriligliptin will give you glycemic benefit. Whether it will give you cardiovascular benefit, or whether it will give you the renal benefit which you saw with Vildagliptin. So it's up to you. If you want me to push and say, Dr. Mukherjee, class effect, I cannot say that. So that is the data you have as of now. So you choose. It's, it's like a mango, one which is ripe and ready to eat. I, I grew up in Lucknow, so the Seri example I'll give, Rajiv is smiling. And the other one is a mango still hanging in the, on, in the tree. It's a mango. It's not ripe enough. So if you want to use Remo and Vilda, Tenelli, for other, other glyptins for, except uh, the ones which have cardiovascular control data, go ahead, use it for glycemic control. But you cannot extrapolate and say they give you cardiovascular renal benefit. That was my talk, cardiovascular and renal benefit the extra glycemic benefits of a SGLT2 DP combination. I know if you want to play the cost card, certainly play the cost card, certainly use it for glycemic control, inverted commas hoping that you may get this benefit. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out like that for us. I'll stop it. Thank you, sir. And we have one question that is uh, for Dr. Jiji Mukherjee, uh, that is in stage five, especially CKD, whether impal in a combination, what's your take on that? Absolutely no. As of now, EGFR less than 45 is the DCGI guideline, but it's now been relaxed to 30 after the DAPA CKD study. In the Emperor Preserve, they went to as low as 20. In the EMPA kidney trial, they're going to go to as low as 25. But you need to wait for those studies. And remember, these are trials where monitoring is very strict. There is a monitoring committee. So for day-to-day -day practice, as of now, I won't go below 30. So CKD stage 5 is a 100% no-no. Uh, EGFR below 15, again, uh, no. Come to CKD stage 5, won't you yes. So answer Thank is you, a clear sir, cut note, clear cut note. So well, and we have one last question because uh, our time is really running out. So we have one last question for Dr. Chawla here. Sir, uh, the next question is for... For you, what is your take on, you know, renaming the classic, uh, you know, regarding from NAFLD to the metabolic associated fat liver disease, uh, this regarding the proposition to rename the class, uh, the uh, syndrome as MAFLD from NAFLD, from non-alcoholic to metabolic associated fat liver disease? Yeah, I, I had, this is what I did in my session. I tried to establish a relationship between insulin resistance, obesity and metabolic syndrome and how it predisposes or it's a precursor of developing type 2 diabetes. So what earlier we have been saying about Neffeld, I think better word is or better nomenclature is today Neffeld that we are trying to link between insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome and uh, obesity and which should be viewed upon as a future risk for developing not only type 2 diabetes, but also is a higher cardiovascular risk because I told you subclinical atherosclerosis and cardiovascular inflammation is going to be much higher in these patients as compared to the control. Uh, one question, Dr. Chawla. You have mentioned that the adiponectin level in the uh, South Asian is uh, much lower than lower. the Caucasians. Whether the lipolectin level is uh, uh, measured uh, or uh, comparison between the two group I of people? There is, a, there is a data on that. I don't think there is a study data on lipolectin levels. Adiponectins are very easily available and these have been compared in most of the races and we know that Asians or Indian patients for that matter are definitely at a much lower adiponectin levels for same amount of BMI, so for same amount of visceral fat as compared to Caucasian patients who still have preserved adiponectin. That is why 
onset of type 2 diabetes happens much earlier in Asians or in Indians, even at a lower BMI, even at a lower uh, visceral fat. In your treatment uh, of NFLD or MFLD, uh, the, uh, there is no mention about the obetocolic acid. Uh, what is the role of that? I didn't find much uh, significant studies, actually. I didn't discuss in detail early stat. I didn't discuss in detail GLP and SGLT2 trials. Little bit is uh, of use is UDCA, but that is also for primarily for enzyme reduction. Overall, it does not change histopathology of uh, liver at all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Chawla, Dr. Mukherjee, and thank Dr. You. Ganguly as well. It was a wonderful uh, knowledge sharing session, and the questions actually keep coming in, but due to severe constraint of time, we are uh, unfortunately we have to end this session right now. So thank you all, and thank Dr. You. Mukherjee, and Dr. Chawla, and Dr. Ganguly as thank well you, on JJ. behalf of BDCon oh. also. Good I night, thank everyone. all of you. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you for having us. For this yeah. opportunity. I now thank hand over the session. Yeah, I now hand Good over time. the session uh, to Dr. Amartya Shankar Choudhury for the next session.